2014's South Park The Stick of Truth did something incredibly impressive, gave us a genuinely fun and exciting RPG experience that felt like you had been dropped into an episode of South Park. And while you might have expected Matt and Trey to leave it at that, feeling good about a wildly successful adaptation of their biggest property into the video game world, they were not satisfied. Instead, they nearly immediately began work on a follow-up, a game that would eventually become South Park The Fractured But Whole. And while it took me a bit longer to come to appreciate the South Park sequel, I can now pretty confidently say that I love it just as much as the first game, and amazingly, for mostly different reasons than I love The Stick of Truth. So, join me as I deep dive into the massive, ambitious, and incredibly impressive sequel, South Park The Fractured But Whole. Basically, the moment they finished Stick of Truth, Matt and Trey had interest in making another South Park game, taking everything they learned over the course of the long development cycle of the first game and implementing it into the new game from the start. We did learn a lot, and I think this game's gonna be much, much better. And now it's going to be worse, because yeah, I just said, that. just said that. But it wasn't just their experience in making the game that helped in the development of Fractured But Whole. Back in 2014, Stick of Truth became a bit of a YouTube phenomenon. Tons of streamers played through it, including PewDiePie, and Trey literally used those playthrough videos for real-time feedback. And it was just the best material I could have, because it was like, I was watching an audience member play it and what they were thinking about it. But they also wanted to change up the game more substantially, opting to abandon the medieval fantasy theming for superhero theming, which makes a lot of sense, given that that the show had already established superhero alter egos for most of the kids through their Coon and Friends trilogy, and those episodes were massively popular, so it made a lot of sense to go that direction. I remember specifically hoping back in 2014 that the next South Park game would transition into the superhero concept, but in addition to the theming change, they wanted to revamp the combat system. Previously more akin to games like Paper Mario with turn-based combat and action commands, this time they opted for a tactical RPG system, still turn-based, but set on a grid with bigger teams and more diverse abilities. And while the game does have a ton more polish, I'll be honest, it took me quite a bit longer to actually properly get into this game. I actually started it two separate times over the years, including on the night it came out, and I never actually finished it until this year. For one, while the game does look amazing, I felt that it lacked the charm of the first. The menu systems were more in-depth and more complicated, I didn't fully understand the nuances of the artifact system at first. Swapping from a simple Facebook friend system to taking selfies with characters felt needlessly complicated. This is a small thing, but in Stick of Truth, when you picked up all the junk item loot around town, there was a little image of what you picked up, showing off whatever deep cut reference to the show that they were making. Fractured But Whole still has these deep cut references, but the new interface is all very digital to match the superhero theme, and it removes the pictures of the items, making every pickup notification look identical in the corner of the screen. Likely just a bit of a psychological thing, but my eyes were never drawn to those notification messages to read the items. It all just looked a little bit sterilized to me. I also was just personally not as accustomed to the tactical RPG combat. In my first couple attempts to play through the game, I managed to get through most of the early battles, but found myself really struggling on what felt like very random story points. Fortunately, on my latest playthrough, something just finally clicked for me in the tactical system, and I only struggled in the truly difficult battles later in the game, and I had a lot of fun with this system. All of these initial turnoffs left my mind entirely as I got deeper and deeper into the game on my latest playthrough. I grew to really love the battle system, I got used to the interface, saw the appeal in the artifact leveling system, and really found myself engrossed in the story and gameplay. But interestingly, I think Fractured But Whole succeeds for entirely different reasons than Stick of Truth. While I did truly love the RPG experience in the first game, I always said that what I loved most about it is feeling like you were just being dropped into a South Park story. The new kid has to make friends with the gang who are in the middle of their fantasy game. Fractured But Whole feels more like a video game and less like a South Park episode. While it's still amazing to roam around the town and the cutscenes are seamless, there are tons of added graphics and effects that make it feel more like a big, polished video game. Almost every single major fight has this amazing battle graphic with an illustration of who you're fighting. The character's superhero abilities are fully visualized in all their glory, both in cutscenes and during battles. And while this is really cool to see, it sort of removes that feeling from the first game, where you really understand that the kids are just playing a game. They're playing pretend. Like, in Stick of Truth, my magic-wielding character would pull out a Roman candle and hit the enemies with it as a quote-unquote spell. But in this game, the kids are literally just launching superhuman abilities at each other. And while I do think that this removes a bit of the charm of the feeling I felt in the first game, I do think this was clearly intentional on Matt and Trey's part. I just like the fact that there's like something that we are doing that we couldn't do in a show. And there's a way to experience the town and jokes in a way that you couldn't do in a show. And ultimately, I actually really liked that they went this direction for the game. Even though it makes it difficult in some instances to understand what is quote unquote real in the story and cutscenes, it was really fun to experience this South Park story in a more heightened world 
world and on a bigger scale. As you remember from Stick of Truth, your character, the new kid, has unbelievable farting abilities. Matt and Trey really wanted to expand on this for the new game. How can we make your farts more powerful than what it was in Stick of Truth? And we're like, could start to bend time. These time bending farts have both a major effect in combat and in the story, but we'll talk about that more later. The important thing is that because of this ability, they wanted to name the game the butthole of time. Unfortunately, they were told that retailers would not put a product on the shelves with the word butthole on it. And so. So I just sat there at my desk for hours and how do I get past butthole, this? Butthole, but, <laughs> butthole, <laughs> butthole. <laughs> Butthole. <laughs> there are actually a couple of precursory concepts in play for Fractured Butthole as well. One of the major plot points of Fractured Butthole is that all of the kids' superheroes have split into two factions, the Coonan Friends and the Freedom Pals. Matt and Trey wrote a specific event where this happened. They even used it in the marketing for the Fractured Butthole. It was the 2016 E3 trailer for the game. However, they struggled with where to place it within the game, story-wise, since it precedes the events of the game. So, the week the game came out, they actually just opted to use it in an episode of South Park to help promote the game, resulting in season 21's episode franchise prequel. It was really the first time of trying to really work backwards from a show and say, all right, what we, we know what the end scene is. We had the, the end scene for a long time and we just kind of had to, to work back from there. So the episode franchise prequel, while largely having a separate plot, results in the scene that splits up all of the superheroes. It's basically all about the kids trying to set up their superhero franchise plan. Who gets what movie in what phase? Who's in what team up movie? And none of them can agree on what to do. So half of them split off and form the Freedom Pals. Go ahead, I bet you don't even get halfway through phase one on your franchise, DC Comics. It's actually pretty funny to go back and watch the old E3 trailer and the final version from franchise prequel and spot all the small differences and dialogue. Also, the trailer has some really dope shots of the kids as heroes. Look how amazing this one of Mysterion above his house in Soda Sopa is. Good stuff. It's also really funny to look at their initial franchise plan here on the big chalkboard, because when you start playing the Fractured But Whole, you can take a look at the board again and see how they've canceled out all of the projects involving the Freedom Pals. But this event is one of the big inciting incidents for the story here, and the other thing that precedes this story should be obvious. This is a sequel to The Stick of Truth. You're playing the same new kid in the same house with the same parents. And this literally happened happens like the next day in town. In fact, the literal beginning of the game, you play as a fully powered up fantasy version of the new kid, as though the kids have just continued playing immediately after Stick of Truth. You go through the entire battle tutorial with the kids all in fantasy garb. There's even this amazing box dragon that the other kids built, and the graphics all match what they did in Stick of Truth. After you defeat it, it dubs you King Douchebag the Dragon Slayer. But in the midst of the fantasy conflict, Cartman jumps in as the coon, tells them he's from the future, and basically convinces all of the kids to play superheroes instead. Dead. In my time, there is a massive crime wave and missing cats. I knew my only hope was to assemble the team. Hey, you can't switch games like this. Where's the stick of truth? Shut up, Kevin. This isn't about some dumb stick. Not only was this a very fun and natural way for the kids to transition from a fantasy story to a superhero story, but it also functions as something that so many sequel video games struggle with. How to explain your main character losing all of their abilities. And so even though you've really risen to prominence in the Stick of Truth game, they're all like, well, you can't play this with us. You're nobody again. Even though you become the most powerful character character in the fantasy world, it was always just a game you and the other South Park kids were playing. So, without a superhero identity, you have to start over right at the bottom of the totem pole. It's pretty smart. Like the first game, this one begins with a dramatic cutscene, but instead of a Bakshi-esque fantasy animation, it's really just a well-boarded South Park sequence. A classic Cartman voiceover, just like in his first appearance as the Coon back in season 13. Ranting about the superhero group splitting up and the crime wave in South Park as cats are seemingly being kidnapped. There used to be laws. Justice. Not anymore. Cartman's plan is to assemble his superhero friends so that they can solve the mystery of Scrambles, the missing cat, and use the $100 reward to jumpstart their superhero franchise. Once the kids switch to their game of superheroes, you've got to get down into the Coon and Friends lair to convince Cartman to let you to play, which jumpstarts your tragic backstory and choices of superhuman abilities. This game gives you far more flexibility in your powers than the previous one. While you'll start off with a single class, you'll slowly unlock more as the game goes on until you eventually have access to all of them, giving you carte blanche to mix and match any kind of character you desire. Your superhero backstory is pretty funny too. The traumatic event always going back to seeing your dad f your mom. Devastating. I do feel that this game takes a bit longer to get rolling than the first one. Between the fantasy prologue, getting into the Coon and Friends lair, choosing your initial class, going through your backstory, and then being told you have to add a bunch of friends on Coonstagram before you move further, just takes a bit longer to be able to start running around South Park. But once you do, South Park is once again an absolute joy to explore. There are a few more obstacles this time around that eventually can be bypassed as you unlock more friends later in the game. The major one being these piles of red Legos that act as lava blocking your path 
path. So the town isn't entirely immediately explorable, but lots of it is, and things have changed this time around. There are a few more shops on Main Street, like the D-Mobile store and Freeman's Tacos, a taco restaurant obviously owned by Morgan Freeman, that plays heavily into the story. You can also now visit classic South Park locations like Raisins, the Peppermint Hippo, Buca de Fagacino, and MFC for some medicinal fried chicken. They also added a little community park next to City Hall, where we often see town gatherings in the show, as well as the Senior Center. In addition to these classic spots, a lot in South Park changed in the show since Stick of Truth released. In season 19, tons of South Park became gentrified, so Skeeter's has been renovated, becoming Skeeter's Wine Bar, Crunchy's Microbrewery has moved in, and if you go down to Kenny's house, you can see the abandoned ruins of Soda Sopa. The farm that was accessible in the previous game has become a memberberry farm now, referencing the ongoing plot of season 20. Stark's Pond is far bigger than it was previously, allowing you to circle the entire thing. You can eventually go to Mephisto's Genetic Engineering Lab, a place the show has barely visited in the past 20 years, but we'll look at that more in depth later, because what they do with it is pretty cool. And probably my favorite little nod to Stick of Truth, the mall is still under construction after it was destroyed by a UFO in the previous game. On top of this, the interiors of most of the previous locations, as well as residential houses, have been upgraded and expanded. The police station is much bigger, houses have more rooms available, and oftentimes basements, and the layouts are slightly updated. Your first real goal is to go gather the other members of the Coon and Friends, namely Kyle, Craig, and eventually Clyde, but each character basically gives you their own submission, and they're all really in-depth and true to the characters. Kyle asks you to fight his alternate universe self, Cousin Kyle, who is dressed up as a dollar store human kite. Craig needs you to help find his guinea pig in his basement, and you have to help Clyde escape his raisins addiction in a big team brawl against the raisins girls. And these all act as mini tutorials as well, to get you acclimated with different aspects of the game. The alternate Kyle fight gives you some one-on-one -on -one battle experience with an opponent with special abilities. Helping Craig gives you access to snap and pop firecrackers and teaches you some overworld abilities. And the raisins fight is your first real big multi-enemy brawl with a team of different heroes. So once the game really gets rolling, they do a great job easing you into new gameplay through these missions. Once you gather the troops, there are a few more side missions you can initiate as well, but Fractured But Whole also gives you a shocking amount of customization in regards to your character through a few other smaller missions. You can even choose your gender identity by meeting with Mr. Mackey at the school. Stick of Truth defaults your character to male, while this game gives you much more customization when it comes to looking feminine, masculine, or somewhere in between. When you talk to Mackey, you can choose if your character is a boy, girl, or non-binary, and I love that they give you the options here, especially since the new kid is a creator character. But I especially love the way they handle it if you choose to be a girl. They basically use the dialogue to retcon Stick of Truth, which never really gave you an option before. Okay, so the whole King and Stick of Truth thing was actually was actually a girl the entire time. You also get to choose whether you're cisgender or transgender, and I honestly don't know of any other game that lets you explicitly create a trans character if you want to. It's pretty awesome in my opinion. Plus, the way they handle this all in the story is very funny. No matter what gender identity you choose, you're discriminated against by a bunch of rednecks. Well, well, well. If it ain't a cisgendered boy. We don't take care to your types around here. There's other gender identity specific dialogue in the game too, some just when chatting with characters in the overworld and some in cutscenes, so it's cool that they give you options for slightly different gameplay experiences. They also start introducing you to Morgan Freeman pretty quickly, who made a brief appearance at the end of Stick of Truth to basically relay exposition, but now he teaches you how to use the crafting system and about the most powerful farting abilities in the game. They say that some farts are so powerful they can actually bend the fabric of time. You be careful out there. The first day wraps up with the first major confrontation with the Freedom Pals, which sets up the ongoing rivalries and the resentment they still feel for Cartman. Craig and Tweak, who have been in a relationship since Season 19's Tweak x Craig, are fighting about how the team splitting also resulted in their breakup. We were supposed to be a duo, remember Tweak? Yeah, I remember! So when I walked out on Coon and Friends, you should have walked out with me! I like Coon and Friends! I feel like, in general, this game is way more nuanced in just about every way it portrays its characters and their relationships. And this is a perfect example. Yes, it's about the video game conflict of the superhero group splitting into two factions, but they also make a point to stop and focus on how this has now affected Tweak and Craig's relationship. But man, the way they use Timmy in this game has got to be one of my favorite things they've ever done with the character, basically having him be the Professor X stand-in, and the leader of the Freedom Pals. <laughs> Out of my head, Timmy. Your franchise is going nowhere. Face the truth, Eric. You guys are kind of douchebags. 
He just caught us douchebags in my mind. It is funny though, because Cartman's dialogue implies that this is all part of the game, but then Timmy immediately is shown to use a real superpower, and later parts of the game don't really make sense if Timmy's powers aren't real. But this leads you to your first fight with the Freedom Pals, which leads to Cartman recovering Timmy's phone and giving your team their first lead in the cat case, searching for the girl with the dick tattoo. Just like Stick of Truth, Fractured But Whole operates on a day-night cycle. During the day missions, you have a bit more free reign over where you go in South Park, whereas the night missions are more linear. Unlike Stick of Truth, the night missions in this game do still take place in the town, but either with massively altered terrain or a very specific path that you must follow. So as usual, before these night missions, you have to head home for bedtime. One of the things this game also expands on is your parents' role and backstory. Stick of Truth hints that they moved to South Park for the new kid's own good, eventually revealing at the end that it had to do with his ability to make friends on social media at an alarming rate. But we don't see much more from the parents in regards to that story. This one gets them much more involved in ways we'll see later, but it also just starts to get them more involved in these cutscenes, showcasing how the move and the stress of their kid's situation is now affecting their relationship. Our child felt the need to go talk to the school counselor. Doesn't that bother you at all? So you told him the truth? No, we didn't talk about that at all. You dumb bitch! You'll ruin everything! Over the game, you see your dad become more and more of a stoner while your mom drowns herself in wine all to cope. It's actually kind of sad. But all in all, outside of a bit of a slow start, it's hard to criticize how much they jam-pack into this first day cycle. It introduces the story and conflict perfectly, gets you acquainted with new battle system and gameplay mechanics, lets you explore a ton of the town without spoiling everything, and gives you the option to start some of the side missions. They even start to hint at your future time-farting abilities with Morgan Freeman. While I still think that the opening sequence takes a little bit too long to get the ball rolling, the rest is handled really economically. And your first night mission is a really fun one, pairing you up with Captain Diabetes aka Scott Malkinson. The other thing I love about these night missions is you're always paired with one specific hero. While I love that you get a ton of character options for combat, one thing I miss about Stick of Truth is walking around town with one of your party members in tow. The night missions give you at least a little taste of that, though you don't get to choose who you go with, and you even get some story-centric dialogue while you're traversing town at night. It also feels like this game sets up and pays off a lot more than Stick of Truth did. It's just a really well planned out game. As soon as you start exploring the town in the first day, you run into Randy, who is pissed that someone is keying his wife's car. Whoever's scratching the car is also leaving notes. I'm just scared it's a jilted lover or something. You won't forget me that easy. I thought we had something. But then as soon as your night mission starts, the first person you run into is Randy, absolutely wasted, keying Sharon's car. Fuck a bitch! See how you like this! It's just a perfect payoff, and you get to fight Randy before you continue the mission. The first night mission is a fun one. You have to sneak into the Peppermint Hippo Strip Club and find a stripper named Classy to get information. When you finally track her down in the back of the club, a wild battle starts where your goal isn't to defeat all of the strippers, but to run all the way to the back of the club and escape, pursuing Classy. All while spontaneous Boutte chases you down, nearly crushing you. And if you get crushed, it's game over. You have to try again. The tactical battle system allows for some pretty cool and unique battles like this, where the goals vary. It requires on-the-fly adjustments and quick thinking, and you may even need to adjust your moveset. When you escape to chase her near the Italian restaurant next door, you're visited by the spirit of Morgan Freeman to grant you a new time fart ability by eating the Enchirito he helped you craft earlier. And the glitch ability allows you to slightly reverse time, which is used to puzzle solve in the overworld as you go through the game. But these time farts also give you abilities in battle. Glitch allows you to cancel an enemy's turn before they use it, which is incredibly helpful. The first time I started the game, I thought maybe these were meant to be saved for special occasions but you basically want to use as many time farts as you can in any given battle, which is once every two or three turns depending on which ability you use. There are definitely some instances where you want to save it, like when you want to save a specific teammate with low health, or if you want to cancel out a particularly powerful attack from an enemy, but for the most part, the more time farts you use, the better off you'll be. And I really love this addition to the gameplay. Obviously the Stick of Truth gave you fart powers basically as magic, but this adds an entire separate function to the combat that really allows you to strategize more completely. Next you learn your first team teammate combo ability in the overworld, farting in Captain Diabetes' face to enrage him and give him superhuman strength, knocking over any items with green bases. This will be used to get past obstacles and solve puzzles in the overworld. The night mission wraps up by discovering a huge storeroom of stolen cats and an Italian mob that looks suspiciously like the cast of The Sopranos, though you're forced to fight a wine-drunk Randy back for revenge. Alright, Captain Diabetes, this is it. Give me my f***ing key. So this first night mission continues the story while also introducing more key mechanics in a really natural way. I also love how the town reacts the next morning to your character becoming a vigilante, very reminiscent of how people first reacted to Mysterion in the show. A new vigilante took to the streets last night 
and has apparently single-handedly taken down the Famboni crime family. Security camera footage showed a young person farting in people's faces on their balls. It was just terrifying. So most importantly, this first day night cycle establishes the story and that the game is mostly paced really well. And as the story progresses, you unlock more and more overworld abilities that allow you to explore more areas of the town and gather more loot. After you help Kyle slash the human kite fight his alternate self again, you can team up to use your farting abilities to fly to certain out of reach locations across South Park. Once you become friends with Stan slash Toolshed, you can use his sandblaster to remove lava from your path. And after Butters becomes playable, you can, well, I don't really want to show how this power works, but basically you can hack into locations you couldn't get into before. Plus, additional time fart abilities give you access to more places. Most of them come into play much later in the game, but the time fart that pauses time allows you to access more areas by bypassing electrified water or automated turret systems. And all of the abilities together make for some really fun puzzle solving. Another big change from Stick of Truth is the costume situation. In the previous game, costumes contained abilities and stat alterations, which meant that the best costume option for you in combat might not be very cool looking or something you want to wear, but with this game being about really creating your own superhero persona, they opted to just give a ton of costume options that you can gather as the game goes on, every single one with customizable color palettes, and none of them change your abilities whatsoever. I messed around with different outfits at first, but eventually I found a combo that I really liked and I wore it for the remainder of the game, this whole black and yellow lightning themed number. The game also features so many side characters in really fun ways. It just feels like a really thorough celebration of so many things South Park. You get to meet Towley at the weed store. Oh wow, Towley! Thought you went to rehab. Yeah, I did, but now I'm back in South Park, clean and sober, almost a year. So of course, in your battle with Towley, you have to light up piles of weed to get him high again, just to chill him out. You meet PC Principal, who teaches you about microaggressions, which give you an extra attack in battle if you catch him in time. Microaggression! Oh. Ah. Later in the game, you meet Seaman, who takes you to help a gay fish to help his mother get to heaven with a super difficult minigame that's a lot like Flappy Bird. This is actually a little dig at Kanye's actual video game concept from years ago. You eventually become friends with Wendy's solo superhero, Call Girl, and you have to help her fight crab people at the D-Mobile store. One of the best, though, is the ongoing feud between Craig and Tweak, which you eventually help solve by getting them to agree to couples counseling. When they finally get back together, you get this new ultimate ability in battle where they team up, complete with yaoi artwork. It's really funny. And the game is just full of these smaller missions that bring countless characters into the fold in really fun ways. And speaking of Yaoi artwork, that's one of the big collectibles this time around. Previously you had to find Chimpokomon, this time you need Yaoi artwork and member berries. But I do have to admit, I kind of miss the Chimpokomon. I think what is most impressive about Fracture But Whole though, is how well they weave together so many different parts of its very complicated story. While I love Stick of Truth for being so digestible and really feeling like you were dropped into a simple South Park adventure, the story of Fracture But Whole feels more like one of their big trillions trilogies or two-part stories, like the Coon and Friends trilogy or 200 slash 201. There are just so many pieces of this story that they set up early that they really effectively tie together down the line. And in classic South Park fashion, it starts with something very simple that the kids want, to find scrambles for the $100 reward, but it eventually unravels until they find themselves in something much, much bigger. The story immediately starts to lay out these pieces, the missing cats, the town not being happy with the mayor, somebody trying to unite all the crime rings in South Park, the police targeting African Americans in town, the new kid's parents becoming increasingly agitated about something regarding their child, and of course, the kid's dilemma, trying to form the perfect superhero franchise plan, and breaking up because of their disagreements. Trying to track down the missing cat immediately leads them to Classy, who reveals more about the crime families trying to join forces, but also gives them their next big lead, revealing the cats are being taken to the U Store It facility. In Stick of Truth, the U Store It was a fun little area mostly filled with loot, Easter eggs, and side missions. You could see Professor Chaos's lair and Al Gore's Man Bear Pig research. Research Center, but this time around, it's a massive one-time location for this night mission only, and it's controlled by... Hello, Coon friends! Coon and friends! Come into my parlor! I've bought more tinfoil and more minions than you can possibly fathom! The expansion of this area is really cool, and it stands out most because of the really creative terrain you have to deal with for the fights. You discover that they're extracting urine from all the cats for recreational drug use, a huge nod to the classic Kenny episode, Major Boobage. But the other major discovery is the extent of Professor Chaos's operation, using countless minions to spread lava Legos across South Park. Oh my god. He's gonna declare the entire town lava. Which gives us one of the craziest boss fight concepts in the entire game, Professor Chaos's massive mech suit built out of tin foil and minions. And this all unveils that there has actually been someone behind this, someone who hired Butters and bankrolled his operation, who has also been trying to unite the crime families and has even been working with the police to get cat urine into the town's supply of drugs and alcohol. And that person's name, Mitch Connor. 
Mitch Cotter? Oh no, 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 no. That's right, they brought in Mitch. Oh, I love this decision. This character obviously was first introduced as Jennifer Lopez in Fat Button Pancake Head, before being reintroduced as Mitch Connor in 200 and 201. But man, what a fun development, because they play up Kyle's frustrations over this whole thing so well. The first episode with Mitch has Kyle reluctantly admit that maybe Cartman isn't messing with everyone, before Cartman makes fun of him for even considering it. And since then, he's just become increasingly fed up with the charade. Shut up, it's not Mitch to Connor. This game really plays into that, as you'll see. I honestly kind of want to do an entire video about Mitch Connor. Let me know if that's something you're interested in. Eventually, you get to swap teams and join the Freedom Pals as the new kid, initially as a ruse, but it gives you access to their entire squad of characters, all of which are really fun to use. And after buddying up to them, you learn that they have information about what's been going down at the police station, leading to both superhero teams heading there for their next night mission. One of my favorite developments with this game is that because the town's drugs and alcohol have been spiked with cat urine, the citizens become increasingly chaotic. Chaotic. Every single night that you go out, things get crazier, and this night in particular just has all of the adults going absolutely insane. You also get to travel with Kenny this time, and I love his little moment of commiseration with you. I'm glad you're with us, new kid. It's been tough being the only one on the team with real superpowers. While all the other kids are playing and working on their franchise plans, I'm stuck defending the city against evil. But let me tell you, the police station mission is insane. You uncover the fact that they've been falsely arresting the black citizens of South Park, you free them, and then you discover why. They're literally feeding them to a Lovecraftian monster. Oh, I see. I guess because cops feed African Americans to an elder god, they're racist. I thought this was a very funny piece of commentary about the police and Lovecraft. But I suppose H.P. Lovecraft was a racist too. Oh, fuck. Was he really? Like, like how racist? Really, really. And this is one of the craziest and most difficult boss battles in the game, too. You have to fight these police cult members while also avoiding the monster tentacles. Ideally, you knock the enemies into the monster, but it's not easy. It's a really creative boss battle mechanic. This next event really starts to send the game into the home stretch. There's a really great reveal that this entire time, Timmy has secretly been working on something to try and help all of the kids. Oh my god, he's figured it out. It was Dr. Timothy's passion. He worked tirelessly on it franchise plan that involved everyone. Each hero got their own movie and TV series. I love this scene. Seeing the kids reconnect and reform their alliance for the greater good. If we proved anything tonight, it's that we are the best when we are all together. But what really makes it work is the Cartman of it all, because we know Cartman is Mitch Connor, and that every single string has been pulled by him. But this was the one thing he didn't expect, something that can really mess up all of his plans. And so, he starts to show his true colors. But we're calling it Freedom Pals? Freedom Pals. And so, like, Timmy is sort of the leader of Freedom Pals? He pretends to be in on it, of course, but the next day is when every single piece of his plan starts to come together. You wake up to find your house covered in blood, your parents kidnapped, and a report playing on the TV about the events that transpired at the police station. Now, with the town in absolute chaos, Mitch Connor is running for mayor. The citizens of South Park deserve to feel safe. Safe, safe from vigilantes who go around farting on people's heads. You have to track down Cartman, who of course refuses to admit he's Mitch Connor. You basically torture him to get him to talk, revealing he wants to genetically alter the cats, sending them to Dr. Mephisto's genetics lab. And I loved this section of the game. For one, we haven't really been to Mephisto's lab since 200 and 201. And now, after all this time, they gave the place a really cool facelift. Mephisto's just got an entire team of geneticists working around the clock to give all kinds of animals so many asses. And now we've been able to give more asses to pigs horses, everything you can imagine. Yes, little boy. How does that help? Oh, you're one of the cynics, huh? I love that they took this classic South Park location and gave it a perfect video game upgrade. Because let me tell you, the monsters and battles you face here are wild. It's a really cool location, and it pays tributes to the series' roots. And this is where you learn Mitch's master plan. Escalate crime in the city, blame crime on mayor, run for mayor, get tons of followers, clone new kid into genetic mutant, win election, make everyday Christmas. I loved how all of these disparate story points tied together. It explains all of the police, crime family, and cat urine stuff, what's been going on with the mayoral election, how the new kid and his parents tie into all of this. Speaking of, Mitch kidnapped them to make that genetic clone, and in an incredibly fucked up sequence, you're forced to decide which of your parents lives and dies in order to proceed forward. The computer is waiting for a DNA sample from your mother. Quick! The only way out of here is to kill daddy. Yeah, 
really dark stuff. The final stretch of the game is filled with great plot twists and incredible boss fights. You have to fight a mutated clone of Kyle's cousin Kyle, an incredibly difficult fight, but the new kid's time farts during this battle end up launching all of them forward an entire week, meaning the election is already over and that Mitch won. Luckily, Morgan Freeman helps you unlock your most powerful time fart ability so they can go back in time to stop Mitch from becoming mayor. This is the seven layer Quesarito Chipotle Beefy Nacho Supreme. The last time someone tried it, they farted so bad it created a wormhole that made time travel possible. I love that the entire final sequence is propelled by time travel. For one, it's just a fun mechanic, but also some of the greatest video games of all time have focused heavily on time travel as a mechanic. But this stretch cements this as a truly outstanding sequel. First, you fart the entire team forward in time instead of backwards, being forced to come face to face with Mitch Connors every day is Christmas future. But this gives you the opportunity to fight the woodland Christmas critters with Santa Claus on your team. Team. Now I know the Christmas critters aren't supposed to be real in South Park, but this is Cartman's Christmas future, so let's give it a pass. And what a great way to implement Santa, too. Uh, Merry Christmas, everybody! And while I loved that sequence, I think the next is conceptually the coolest part of the entire game. It's what cements Fractured But Whole is not just a great South Park game, but a perfect sequel. You fart everyone so far back in time, it takes you to the beginning of the game. Literally, the opening scene, when the kids are still playing Stick of Truth. Which leads to this hilarious confrontation between the superheroes and the fantasy personas from the previous game. This isn't a trick, it's me, Craig. You, dude. I'm Craig. And so you get to do an entire fight, Fractured But Whole vs. Stick of Truth, and it feels like such a beautiful celebration of both of these video games. This battle cycles in and out your entire squad of heroes from the entire game, giving them all time to shine, while the fantasy kids also cycle in and out, which gives you an opportunity to see all of their powers and abilities fully realized in the new tactical battle system. It's a tiny bit disappointing that you don't see Cartman, Kenny, or Stan's Stick of Truth personas in the fight, but the lineup of Kyle Butters, Craig, and Clyde and your past self makes for a really fun fight. After this fight, which to me is one of the absolute highlights of the game, they still have to wrap up the story, and there are two major plot points still in play. The kids confront Cartman, who is about to kick off the events of the entire game. Show us your fucking left hand! Heh. <laughs> Hello, Freedom Pass. Time travel. Ain't it a bitch. Connor punches you, forcing a time travel fart that sends you back to your traumatic origin story, and we finally get some answers about the new kid, and it is very silly in the best way. You manage to change history and stop yourself from seeing your parents do it, at which point they tell you the secrets about themselves and your character. Both of them have some kind of social media superpower where they gain an unfathomable number of followers even without trying. They met when they were being studied by the government and fell in love, eventually escaping and giving birth to you. You received over 10 million followers the minute you were born. On top of that, you find out your mom has been putting medicine in your food to curb the social media abilities, and that medicine just gave you really powerful and really smelly farts. So after we found out that the new kid's abilities in the last game were social media based, we get full-on answers in this game to not only where they came from, but also how they're connected to his unbelievable farting powers. I don't know, I thought this was all a very funny explanation, and I love that they chose to continue building story around these abilities in the sequel. Hell, they even utilized them in the mobile game South Park Phone Destroyer, another game starring the new kid. Would y'all be interested in a video dedicated to the new kid himself? Sounds like it might be a fun challenge. Anyways, after you get some closure from your parents, who both decide to stop abusing weed and wine, you manage to fart yourself to the proper time period. Mitch Connor inauguration day, setting the stage for the final story battle. And I love that they put Kyle and Cartman at the center of this conflict, making it feel like a real culmination of the Mitch Connor saga. Then how do you explain this, Cal? That's not funny, Cal. I'm not doing it. Kyle completely turning the tables on Cartman, trolling him by pretending his hand is Mitch Connor is such a funny idea, especially since none of the other kids seem to have any clue if any of this is real or not, leading to the very fun final battle. Well, Freedom Pass, who do you attack? Me? Or the king. This battle has all kinds of crazy rules. If Mitch slash Kyle gets hit, it hurts Cartman, and then you eventually have to beat both Mitch Connors, leading to the hilarious final scene. One, two, three! I was just f***ing with you. Ha ha, gotcha! Ow! As Mitch tries to get sworn in, the kids all jump in and reveal his scheme, using a selfie you took with his evil plan back at the genetics lab. There's this weird final sequence where Mitch talks to his mom for closure about his own past. It's all very silly, and it ends the game on a very funny note. Well. Thank God that guy isn't gonna be mayor. Come on, everybody. Let's go get clean drugs and alcohol from the next town over. Yeah! yeah!
Man, I love how these games end with the classic South Park credits. It's funny every single time. While I'm a huge fan of the Stick of Truth ending twist, as they fittingly force you to kill Kenny as a fun nod to the show's history, making Cartman the real antagonist of this game makes so much story sense. He's always been the villain of these superhero stories in the show, and the show also always has him in the most antagonistic roles. But the way all of these stories come together in such a massive and ridiculous fashion is such a fun escalation from the story in Stick of Truth, which admittedly did have some really big and fun stuff towards the end, but this one just felt bigger and more intricately intertwined all the way through. Not to mention the battles just create for a much more difficult and strategic gameplay experience. In fact, I'm not sure I would have gotten through all of these final battles without a particularly powerful optional time fart ability. You may have seen me use it in some of the battle footage. If you finish a couple of optional side quests and get Miss Cartman's double stuffed brownies, as well as a bucket of member berry juice from the farm, you can combine that into a special chocolate memberito. By eating this, it gives you a fart that allows you to summon your past self into battle for four turns, basically just giving you an additional clone of your own character to help fight. It is unbelievably helpful in some of these later fights. But there's actually a bit more to talk about, because unlike Stick of Truth, Fractured But Whole actually had proper story DLC, which I did not play until I wrapped up the main story. But if I'm being honest, I think you should consider playing the DLC before you finish the main quests. For one, the big finale to the main story just feels like a bigger and better ending. And two, you can gain access to new classes and team members in Henrietta and Mintberry Crunch that would be super helpful in the main story. But the story DLCs for this game are both great. The first, from Dusk Till Casa Bonita, brings you to Casa Bonita itself to help Kenny save his sister Karen from a vamp kid birthday party. Casa Bonita itself is a really fun place to explore. They jammed surprisingly large locations into these DLCs. This also gives a very funny focus on Mr. Adams, the caseworker for Child Protective Services, who is fittingly first introduced in The Poor Kid. Pretty cool, huh, Mike? I dressed up like Kiefer Sutherland and I'm all like, hey, I'm the master vampire. This is the coolest birthday party ever, isn't it, Mike? But what I love most about this DLC is that it's another great story about Kenny and Karen's relationship, standing alongside the poor kid and the city part of town. Kenny just wants to help Karen escape the vamp kids, but her reason why she hung with them in the first place leads to this really heartwarming moment. I just wanted to have some friends to play with. My brother, he's my best friend, but he's always too busy to hang out with me. Oh, well, uh, I'll have a talk with him. I I'll make sure he spends more time with you. I promise. The second DLC is called Bring the Crunch. This one mashes up our first ever follow-up to the Mintberry Crunch story in the Coon and French trilogy with the Lake Tardy Kaka location from Crippled Summer. The tone and atmosphere of this DLC is really great. You have to investigate missing counselors at the camp who go missing at the hands of an alien who escaped Mintberry Crunch's home planet. The final battle of this DLC is really incredible as a mind-controlled Timmy launches timed attacks at various parts of the battlefield as you try to fight the alien. Visually and strategically really cool. But damn, I was not even remotely ready for the reveal of why that alien hated Mintberry Crunch. That Zargonor and his parents used to be slaves in my family's berry mines on our home planet. Until he escaped. Oh, uh, wait a second. Your family owned his family? Sure. How else do you think we picked all those cotton berries? This was not a twist I saw coming for MBC. Not even a little. But overall, these DLCs were great. They each added about two to three hours of story. I almost wished we'd gotten more, but the next time I replay the game, I'll definitely be doing them before I finish the main story. However, I did do these DLCs before the super secret optional final boss, and I'm glad I did. If you hit Morgan Freeman with three snap and pops in a row, you trigger an incredibly difficult boss battle. You absolutely need that optional time fart power to finish finish this fight. It has to be impossible without it, seeing as Freeman has that same power himself. Honestly, the only real reason I was able to finish off this battle is because of the new ultimate ability I got from the final girl class in the Bring the Crunch DLC. This ultimate power allows you to execute enemies if they're below a certain percentage of health. Freeman has so much health that I never would have been able to defeat him normally, but because he had a certain percentage threshold, I was able to finish him off using that ultimate ability. And honestly, I don't think I would have survived even a single turn after this. This is a hard battle and such a fun way to close out the game. But there's one last little piece of story that I skipped over in the post credit scene. Your parents are now deeply in love after you change the past, which leads you to actually end up seeing them do it, despite stopping yourself in the past. Which leads to this ominous sequence with Professor Chaos. Don't you see that Chaos always catches up with you? You've tried being a hero. Why not let your darker side free? What I love about this ending is that it's set up very well throughout the game. Unlike Stick of Truth, where everybody just sort of loves the new kid, as this story proceeds, the other kids sort of start to turn on him, even for things that aren't really his fault. We're sorry the new kid is an asshole. That isn't our fault. Oh, great! The new kid farted us to next week! Damn it! He screwed us! 
Way to go, new kid! So hinting at a potentially villainous turn for a sequel is a pretty fun tease. The Fractured But Whole is such a substantial sequel to the first game, in nearly every single way. While I still maintain that its polish and upgrade removes a bit of the charm of the first game, there's absolutely no denying how much bigger and more intricate the Fractured But Whole is. The story feels like a massive epic far beyond the scope of the original. The battle system allows for not only more strategy options, but much more creative and difficult specialized battles. The customization for your superhero persona are off the charts from ability to design. South Park itself has been expanded and continues to give us beautiful new locations from the show to explore. It not only embraces the ideas established for your character in the original game, but it fully expands on them in a really fun way. They basically took the ideas in the first game and injected them all with steroids. It does everything a sequel should do, and it feels like a story that could have only been told in this medium. And luckily, they aren't done yet. Matt and Trey are now working on a third South Park game, so next time, let's speculate about the possible themes and concepts we might see in the upcoming sequel. Folks, thanks for watching. This video turned out way bigger than I anticipated it would. If you enjoyed, please check out some of my other South Park videos and stay tuned for more. Peace. Johnny!